Amen. So you can all hear me, right? Yeah. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, several weeks ago, Pastor asked me to, as he has asked other pastors as well to share the word. And so uh, last minute, he asked me, hey, can you cover for the third and all that? And so um, as I was contemplating, praying about what topic that I would cover, uh, about the time that when Pastor asked me, um, our Sunday school class was about Nehemiah. So somehow my head kept going back and going back to that to that topic that uh, our brother Lucian taught a while back. Uh, so anyway, uh, here we are today, and and uh, I'm here to sort of uh, uh, expand a little bit more on what uh, we've learned uh, in our Sunday school, and so our text earlier was read uh, by Kailana and as uh, it's about the book of Nehemiah so sort of chose the title about Nehemiah uh, Nehemiah on the retreat all right so let me ask you this who who's Nehemiah what do we know of him so quickly here's a quick background so his name Nehemiah means uh, the Lord of Comforts, and also mean this uh, Nehemiah was born in exile and uh, went to Babylon and rose through the ranks, and he became a king artist, Artaxerxes cupbearer. So he's he's quite powerful. So basically, cupbearer, you 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 hold the cupbearer for the king, or you taste whatever drink it is. He is going to be drinking, be it at a formal ceremony at his dinner, so guess what? Because there may be people that would want to kill the king, right? Uh, so the place was in Babylon. Uh, at the same time, also, God uses Nehemiah's position to accomplish his purposes for his people in far of Judea. And one thing for sure, that Nehemiah has a strong faith in God. All right? So historically at the time, King Cyrus of Persia, this was before King, before right before King Artaxerxes, he issued a decree allowing the Jews or the Israelites to return to their homeland to rebuild, uh, be able to rebuild. Right. So uh, he allowed them to do that, but because normally at that time the other forces would not allow the. Uh, natives or the people to go back to be able to rebuild. So basically they get assimilated by whatever population, whoever's the dominant force or whoever's the winning force to uh, use them as, as slaves. So in this case, uh, King Cyrus said, okay, you guys go back and, and uh, uh, to, to rebuild your, your, your Jerusalem. So this was happened during the time of Ezra. So in the, well, in the Bible, Ezra was be right before, uh, they're like uh, following each other. So Ezra was before uh, Nehemiah. So in essence, God used the king of Persia to allow his people to return to Jerusalem. Right? And so Nehemiah comes into the picture about 90 years later. In Babylon and inquired. All right? So after 90 years, the Israelites have been back to, to Jerusalem trying to rebuild, trying to do all these things. So Nehemiah uh, inquired of his brother Hanani on the condition of Jerusalem. And so um, Nehemiah, so we pick off at verse 3 where Nehemiah receives his report from his brother Hanani. All right. So today... What we're going to do, what we're going to, to in essence, what's, what's going to happen here is sort of what I call the bottom line up front, is God wants a relationship with us. He moves in response to our desperation for Him. Number two, He allows trouble in our lives because He knows that we will, that will bring us to our desperate up for Him. Right, so let me ask you this. Uh, how many of us or who among us have not had uh, been desperate. Uh, who among us have not been sort of uh, 
uh, you're back in a corner and can't do anything except to pray. So I would, without a raise of hand, because then I'm going to assume that most of us, if not all of us, have been at some point, at one point, or somewhere during our lifetime, that we've been, we felt helpless, we, we felt desperate in our situation. So there are times we come into this situation that we tend to deceive ourselves into thinking our spiritual lives are fine. So sometimes when nothing is happening, there's no crisis, there's no uh, major problems, especially reports from back in the Philippines. So everything is hunky-dory. You know, we're, we're okay. So even when we have no intimate walk with Jesus, even with no fellowship with others and no sense of being on mission to make disciples. I don't know if you see this, but the reality is that we need refreshing water of God's presence in our lives. Sometimes these things happen in us for a reason. And uh, Lucian had a good uh, class earlier that, you know, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. So for us believers, um, we accept, be it good, I don't, be it bad. If we're true believers, we know that we receive it, Lord. You know, you have a reason. You have a purpose why these things are happening to us. All right. So moving on, what happens? I call the slide as the bad news. So in verse 3, so I would encourage you that you keep your Bibles open to Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 10. So we're kind of going to go in back and forth, so I encourage you to read that. So it says in verse 3, all right, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. All right, so here's the scenario. So when Nehemiah receives the report, his brother Hanani tells him that, you know, so sometimes we call back home and ask, what's going on back there? So Hanani tells his brother that, you know, the, the walls have been broken down, not because of the, uh, the conquerors of the Persians, but because basically uh, what has happened was that uh, at this point in time, it's been 90 years, the Israelites were not able to rebuild fast enough. So they had uh, many problems. So uh, you know, he said they got in trouble and distress. Uh, the second one, it says the wall of Jerusalem has been broken through in many places. So the Israelites were unprotected. A lot of people want to uh, take over Jerusalem, want to attack them, or they attack them. All right. The attempts to rebuild the wall were unsuccess unsuccessful because the enemies kept coming. They were very vulnerable. So, so if imagine you're in a big city back then, you're in Jerusalem. It's if there's a wall, if the wall is up, then you're protected. You can control people coming in, and people coming out. But because they've had, they've been uh, Nebuchadnezzar tore down the wall of Israel. Uh, a while back. So they're still not able to do, uh, they're not able to work fast enough to rebuild that wall. Uh, so imagine 90 years later, they're still, those things are still happening. So the thought of Nehemiah was that how can this happen to God's people? You know, uh, when he heard this, when Nehemiah heard this, he was heartbroken. He was really, uh, he felt bad. Uh, so now we see sort of God's uh, plan coming into place. So because Nehemiah has power, you know, he's the king's cupbearer, sikat siya, di ba? You know, he could easily or he could come before the king, lay the case, and and you know, uh, don't know if things would happen. But instead, what happened? The first thing that Nehemiah did was he wept, fasted, and prayed. So let's go to verse 4. This is what it says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. 
For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. All right? So that's what he did. So normally, the normal response would have been was to rush before the king to petition for his help. All right? Nehemiah was also heartbroken and he, it humbled him. So he comes, what he did was, as we read the, the verses, he came before the Lord for days to mourn, to pray, and to fast. It's not, he didn't just do it once. It says here for days. So it happened several days. It may have been a week. It may be, you know, but, you know, he was doing this. He was praying. He was mourning. He was so, uh, uh, he felt bad what was going on in Jerusalem. Because in Jeremiah 29, God promised the Israelites. God knew that they would be, uh, they would be disobedient. God knew that uh, uh, they would have the opportunity to, re to be rebuilt. So in Jeremiah 29, verse, 13, verse 12 and 13, he said, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all your heart. So that was God's promise in Jeremiah to the Israelites. All right. So in verse, continue on on verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive, pakinggan kami, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. He's praying before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. So this is Nehemiah crying before God, telling him the condition of what's going on, and that he was praying to him day and night. So Nehemiah focused on God's word, focused on God's character. He didn't just he didn't just come before him and said, "Lord, this is what I need." So Nehemiah, if we look at the at verse five, is he recognized that God, he. When he spoke to him, he talked about his character. All right? It says here in the second line, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So that's a powerful thing that he recognizes, Nehemiah recognizes what, who God is. And sometimes we don't do that. That we, when we come before the Lord, we just say, Lord, this is what I need. And we give him, we give him a laundry list of the things that we want necessarily the things that we need but the tendency is to just come before him and ask him all right lord i need you to provide for me but here nehemiah is showing us how he had to deal with it <clears throat> because he know that uh, he recognizes what israel has done all right he also prayed that god would listen to his prayer and have mercy and compassion so he asked for god lord have mercy on us he did it he hasn't even mentioned anything about the needs or his or what Israel's going through. So he, you know, uh, he also also asked for mercy and compassion. All right. So our hope of moving forward spiritually is not based on overcoming our problems, but on the simple fact who God is. So that's how we need to start our prayers of our relationship. We have a true relationship with God is. You know, we just don't do a laundry list. We go, we recognize who he is, what he's done for us, what his promises are for us, uh, how great he is, you know, uh, all these things that who God really is, his character, you know, uh, kind of like what uh, Nehemiah did, right? So if we find, if you find your, yourself in a place of devastation and desperation, consider the character of God and surrender to him. So first and foremost, we need to go before Him and recognize and acknowledge Him, who He is, what He is to us. That He is not just someone that we ask of, just like our, you know, somebody that will just provide anything. In essence, this is the path to spiritual renewal and awakening. As we continue to move forward, when we encounter crisis, our first response typically is to try to fix it ourselves. Right? So when we're faced with that, it's okay, how can I solve this? 
you know, who can I call or who can help me out or what do I need to do with all these things. So we're in our heads, uh, especially the guys, you know, what are the solutions we're already, once we encounter a problem, we start thinking, okay, how can I fix this? Uh, what, what, can I, what are the tools that I need? Or, you know, uh, what are the situations I need to do so that I can overcome this? This can be true, it be at home, when you have projects, be it at, uh, at uh, work, uh, when faced with crisis situations, or your boss is hammering down on you, or whatnot. All right. So, Nehemiah did something else. Nehemiah did the opposite by retreating into prayer and fasting. So for, and I am guilty of this as well, that I usually worry about it, and then if I'm ready, up against the wall, then that's the only time I pray. But Nehemiah, first and foremost, what he did was retreating to prayer and fasting. The reality is that retreating into prayer is actually the best way to those problems. The prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. When we seek God in prayer and fasting, He responds. So the truth of the matter is, if we sort of reverse it and come to him first, uh, recognize that we are helpless, that we recognize that he is our only hope from the first rather than the last, then uh, it would work better. All right. So let's move on. Like I said earlier, Nehemiah prayed first. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 6 here. Nehemiah basically confessed first. So in verse 6 it says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. So that's the bottom of verse 6. In verse 7, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you, have, you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. So that already happened, all right? The Israelites were dispersed. So this is already sort of a uh, uh, confirmation of what has happened to the Israelites. In verse nine, but if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. All right. So that also had happened. So through king, uh, through the king, the Israelites went back to Jerusalem. So, but at that point, they're still vulnerable. They're still without uh, their own place. So it says in verse 10, they are, your, uh, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your might, mighty hand. So Nehemiah sought restoration for his fellow Jews, but he began himself. What's interesting is uh, Nehemiah not only included himself, but he also included, he confessed to, the, to, to God that, you know, including my father's family, have not treated you God well. So he recognized also in verse 8 the consequences of unfaithfulness. So Lord, this is the situation because of what we did. Or not only, he didn't say, oh, what my predecessors did. All right. So imagine, if you come to think of it, Nehemiah was probably not even born yet when that happened. Because he came to the picture about 90 years later. So as a whole, collectively, Nehemiah was confessing on behalf of his ancestors. All right? So he also recognized in verse 9 about restoration. Right? And he also asked God to remember his promise to Moses. So all these elements were, were in that just three verses that we read. So when we look at the whole verse in Nehemiah's prayer, all right, what did it contain? It is a cry for God's ears to hear his plea on behalf of his fellow Judeans. It 
also included a confession of sin to God. All right? He recognized that they are wicked of what they've done and for their exile as punishment, as just punishment for their sins. So Nehemiah recognized that, Lord, we deserve that punishment that you scatter us because we have been disobedient. We have been sinful before you. Uh, there is an acknowledgement of that. Uh, also, all right, the third piece, like I said earlier, is it was a call upon God to remember his promise. So it is it is also important that when we be, come before him is that if we have the time to also read the scripture, God has a lot of promises, right? You know, it's all it's in the Old Testament, the New Testament, he's got a, a lot of promise. So in this case, Nehemiah cling to that promise. Lord, if you remember you told Moses that this is what will you what you will do to those who are faithful to you. <clears throat> so by the same token for us, we need to look at the Bible and find those promises. And as we come before him, we remind him, Lord, these are your promises and I cling to them. And that's what we need to do is sometimes we just lay out, Lord, this is what I need. Well, you know, that's why it's important we also go back to the Bible and say, okay, what does the Lord say about all this? wants that we have, kung mga gusto natin. Uh, we need to go back and say, look at the, His words and what are His promises to us. And it's there for us to take. It's there for us to play. Uh, but it's just that we need to spend the time to find them. Find those wonderful and beautiful nuggets of truth in the Bible that we can use as Nehemiah used them. Alright? And you can you know, uh, Use that as your 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 claim to the victory that he has promised you. Especially if you know that you're doing what you're doing is right, and it is in his will, and somehow there's either a roadblock or there's something's going on that it's not moving forward. You know, I encourage you all to go back and look at those promises and claim them as you pray before the Lord. So I said, it is also a reminder to God that the remnant who return to the land are his servants. So Nehemiah told God that, Lord, hindi ka away to, they're not, the Israelites are not your enemies. He reminded God who they are. That those who are now, who went back to Jerusalem to rebuild <coughs> are also his children. They are also his servants and doing their the best they could with under the circumstance. And lastly, it is a plea that God's ears be attentive to the prayer of his servant. Nehemiah was asking God, Lord, may you find favor as I pray before you, as I pray for my fellow Israelites. So it is Nehemiah that really was trying to move God into uh, you know, remembering what he has promised, recognizing that they have seen. Uh, as he continues on later on down the uh, various chapters that you will see if you continue to read Nehemiah is, you know, Nehemiah has yet to present this to the king. So this is just between God, Nehemiah and God. So he still has to, in, down in the other following chapters that he still has to go before the king. He still needs logistics. You know, how can, you know, how can I make it happen? So he just doesn't know that yet at this point in time. So that is addressed down the, the following chapters. And uh, if you have the time, I would encourage you to read Nehemiah. And it's, it's a wonderful story. So, Let me say this before, a this is a challenge that I give everyone, <clears throat> or to us, be before God brings a revival to a nation or group of people, he brings it first to the hearts of individuals. So uh, it starts with us, it starts from within, it starts maybe from one person, and maybe it, all it takes is you know somebody uh, to pray for, for what's going on around you or whatnot. It doesn't start from 
other places. It starts from within. It can, one person's confession and repentance can be the spark that ignites a great awakening. Right? So all it takes is one. It doesn't have to be, hey, come join me and all that. So, you know, it may be a quiet time that you so want to have with God and just kind of lay out your heart before Him. Right? And thirdly, God burdened Nehemiah about his own condition. And he used Nehemiah to rebuild and to restore. So <clears throat> Nehemiah became the catalyst so that uh, down the road, resources, uh, you know, Nehemiah was able to take off from his work for a while to go to Jerusalem and obtain the necessary, uh, should I say, permits or letters or letters of introduction that he needed so that he could go back to Jerusalem with the power and authority of the king. Because if he doesn't, the enemies know that he doesn't have those, guess what? They'll kill him. And all this was all for nothing. So down, in the, down the line that Nehemiah was able to do many, many wonderful things for the Israelites because he came before the Lord first. He recognized what he needed to do. That he has to come flat before God and ask for forgiveness first. So, in closing, all right, we all receive bad news, but there is a way that we can deal with it. All right? It's not what we think, but we need to pray first. All right? Prayer is important. Uh, our quality of prayer is important. Uh, sometimes we tend to uh, especially when we're tired or weary or just we only have five minutes to spare, uh, we just tend to pray just, I would say, haphazardly or just, well, okay, uh, it was just a murmur or a, a, a quick, you know, parang uh, wala. It's, it's, it's not meaningful. So, lastly, there has never been a great movement of God that was not preceded by the extra, extraordinary prayer of God's people. So if we go back to history, go back here, just like the situation is, Nehemiah prayed for all those things in order for Israel to rebuild. <clears throat> he had to pray before the Lord so that he would find favor to his king so that he could get the resources that he needs. If you remember a similar story of that is Ruth. All right, so... You know, uh, they, Nehemiah prayed, and so I encouraged everyone that, uh, you know, change it up a little bit. That especially if we're faced with, in, 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 we're in desperation, let's not, let's try to switch it around. You know, like I said a while back that, you know, test him. You know, test him in all these things, including the way we pray, so that, we could, we will find out, and it will, he will open our eyes on how powerful prayers can be and how powerful and how awesome our God is really uh, if we just try it, try him out and test him out. All right. Thank you. Amen. So,